Welcome to NYU and to the Friends of Liberia uh, and USIP program on electing a president. This is the first time that Friends of Liberia has done this type of thing for quite a while, um, but we do want to have more communication with people who are interested in Liberian affairs, and we also want you to know about our organization, which is over 30 years old. It was founded by former Peace Corps um, volunteers, but now includes people all over the world, academics, missionaries, medical people. Uh, we're a very welcoming group, and we still are all volunteers. So uh, I couldn't offer the speakers any kind of stipend today, and they came anyway. So that, oh, that really? showed. <laughs> I didn't tell Ambassador <laughs> Greenfield Thomas that. <laughs> She thought a check was waiting. No. You said that would get up and cool. <laughs> and I told James I'd, I'd feed him palm butter later, so we'll, we'll make up for it that way. I want to thank NYU for allowing us to use this space. We have the most wonderful technical and program assistant that I've ever worked with, I think. And I really appreciate everything that they're doing for us to make us feel at home, and help everything run smoothly. You're welcome to move closer to the front if you would like, uh, but if you're comfortable where you are, that's OK, too. Uh, I would like this to be a, a conversation. We'll start off with the panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions. But uh, I believe you were given little um, index cards as you came in. And I would like you to write questions on those. We will handle those questions first. And then after that, uh, if we still have some time, we'll have the open mic for things that may come up during the question period. Would you take 30 seconds, maybe even a minute, and either turn around or turn forward and say hello to the person that's near to you and find out who they are and what they're doing? <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate. I appreciate the time of your doing that. And I really like the fact that I have to cut you off, because that means that when we finish and we have refreshments, that you are going to love talking to each other even more. Um, you, one often doesn't find an audience that really enjoys talking about Liberia and whatever connection that you may have with it. Uh, I am not going to take up too much time right now because I think we have a, a good program. And I will take the liberty as the moderator. Um, I not only get to be nervous, but I get to butt in and ask questions if I think that uh, perhaps the, a particular speaker has more to say than what they've been able to give you or may have some background that they're not sharing with you because they assume you already know it. Um, I'll introduce each person as we go along and keep questions in mind, but um, I know we'll all focus on listening to what people say. During the question and answer time, I may be taking some notes up here on the uh, flip chart because I've, in my career, I was with the State Department. I was also a Peace Corps volunteer. And I always used to hate to go to meetings that were just talking meetings. People can talk and talk and talk and talk, and nothing ever gets done. So my ideal for this meeting would be that at the end, after you have had your input, that we've got some pretty concrete suggestions or proposals or ideas that we might share with whatever new government comes into Liberia 
to help them with the challenges that the country faces. So I, with further, no further ado, I would like to introduce James Buddy. Uh, you may know James from the uh, VOA programs. He's been with them for several years. He's now the manager of Daybreak Africa. He has, is a Liberian. Uh, we've known each other for decades, you, although we've been a, away from each other for a good decade or so. And uh, James has been up to the minute with developments in Liberia. So I would like him to start off uh, James is an award-winning journalist. Uh, I could go on for a long time about how good he is, but uh, please go to, your, to his bio uh, online if you'd like more information, and I won't take away from your presentation. You. Wherever you want. All right. I... Oh, this doesn't have a mic. Okay, I can use the mic. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, she lowered me to come to this event because she promised me some Liberian food. <laughs> That's the only way I can come to this program. I love Liberian food. Anyway, um, as she said, I'm, I'm, we try to be up to date. This morning on my program, Daybreak Africa, I had the election commission. You all know that uh, um, there been a challenge to the results of the October 10th election. So four parties challenged the results because they said there were some irregularities. So the, the, um, court, the Supreme Court ordered the Election Commission to put a hold on the, re, on the runoff. And so last, the commission already heard all the complaints from these four parties. The ruling unity party took a petition to the court yesterday and this morning, the court, um, the, the, the petition was for, to force the election commission to provide documents. Um, the background to that is that uh, the, the commission feels that if, if the, the ruling party and the other three parties claim that there were irregularities, they are supposed to provide evidence. So the way I know it is that I was told by the commission is that uh, they came to the commission, then started to request for information that they will use to provide evidence for their case. Meaning, and according to the election commission last night, what they were telling me is that if they have to provide the information that these four parties are asking for, that means about 10,000 ballot boxes that they, the commission will have to turn over to them. So uh, you can see that, that it's not feasible to do that. So the commission rejected that, that request. Uh, the board, a hearing board in the commission rejected the request. And uh, a board uh, also considered that and rejected it. So the ruling party went to the Supreme Court with that petition to force the commission to provide. This morning, uh, this afternoon, here our time, the court threw that, uh, that petition out. So this is a text somebody sent me from the Supreme Court as soon as it happened. Uh, the court concluded and denied the bill of information filed by the Unity Party and called on the National Elections Commission to dispose of the case before November 22nd. November 22nd is very important because the Liberty Party filed its complaint, I think it was on the 23rd of October. They filed their complaint and under the Constitution the commission has these 30 days to deal with all complaints following the election. That's why the court mentioned November 22nd. So as things stand, I, we can, I can just maybe say that next week, Wednesday, the, the election commission is going to dispose, as the Supreme Court directed, dispose of this petition. And maybe it will immediately schedule uh, a runoff. So, I'm just saying, this is my guess. We don't know, because this afternoon I was talking to one of the um, uh, party leaders who filed the complaint, and I asked, uh, what's up, you know? And then, <laughs> and they said, it was an uh, uh, interlocutory ruling on UP's bill of information 
The case continues at the, at the neck tomorrow, Saturday. So meaning they have, the parties are going to go back again to the election commission. Um, maybe, I don't know what they, maybe they, they have more case to, to plead with the election commission. But the court has ordered, the main thing is that the Supreme Court ordered the election commission to get rid of the uh, challenge by November, November 22nd. Um, you know that uh, during the week, the US Embassy in Liberia also issued a statement. Um, and this morning, I was talking to the election commission. They felt, they said, I said, well, what do you make of the statement from the US Embassy? The embassy basically said that it confirmed, it said that the elections were credible. The October 10th election were credible. Um, and, uh, and they said, while there may, have, if there were any problems at all, one or two or few problems, you cannot say that there should be a rerun. Instead, the election commission can use that time to make, to make corrections for, for the next election. Uh, and they just called on the two parties to make sure the, 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 the ruling unity party and the Coalition for Democratic Change to prepare to engage their people and to uh, get ready for the runoff. Mm -hmm. So the election commission this morning was telling me that it feels kind of vindicated because that's what it has been saying all along that the, the process was credible. Whatever errors may have been there were not targeted at any particular political party. So that was the election commission's argument. All right, there are a lot of things that happen, so I want to stop right there. Just wanted to bring you up to date where we are. Thank you. Thank you, James. Yeah. Um, we will have some a lot of questions for James during the question and answer period, um, including what Liberians are, uh, the common Liberian is saying about um, how things are going, because I know you're in touch with a lot of them, as I have been as well. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Jonas Kleiss, who works for the US Institute for Peace. And um, Jonas has been a, a good partner these last few weeks as we've tried to decide whether to have this program or not after the elections were called off. And um, I know that he's been working on a broader area of elections and peacekeeping. And so um, Jonas, please. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, happy to stay seated here if, uh, if that's a possibility. Uh, thank you all for coming this uh, afternoon. So while, while most organizations that are engaged in elections work on promotion of credible uh, free and fair elections, my organization's US Institute of Peace takes a slightly different approach uh, and is primarily looking at the promotion of peaceful elections and the prevention of election violence. In some cases, those mandates may overlap, but often that is not the case. In our research in Liberia and across the world, we primarily look at efficacy questions. So what works to prevent election violence? What does not work? And under which conditions does this hold? So the next few minutes, I'll briefly discuss the election process, provide a bit more context uh, to the great introduction that James already provided. Um, and I will also offer some thoughts on, on what was done to prevent election violence and uh, what perhaps was missing. Uh, our findings on what really worked in the election process will evidently come in the next uh, couple of months, so stay tuned for that. Um, about a year ago, I, I would say that there were several reasons to be concerned about these elections in Liberia, as there were some of the most reliable predictors for election violence that were present. Um, it was going to be a competitive race. Um, President Sirleaf was stepping down. There was no clear successor uh, standing up. That's often already an indicator that elections may get tense. Um, there was a recent uh, history of, of, of mass violence uh, in Liberia. That's also an important predictor. So in the literature, one would say that a history of election violence is the best predictor of future uh, election violence. There was some indications that there was going to be a, a lack of funds and infrastructure to guarantee credible elections and election security. Uh, the NEC faced some significant budget uh, shortages and the Liberia National Police um, had been notorious for, for corruption and even uh, human rights abuses. 
And there is a large group of unemployed youth that is vulnerable to mobilization. So some of those risk factors do add up at putting Liberia at least at medium risk of, of election violence. Definitely not in the category of some other countries that we've seen, uh, your Kenya's, uh, certain countries in Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, for example, which have repeatedly high levels of election violence. Certainly not at that level, uh, but there were some, some reasons to be concerned. And for now, unfortunately, we must say that Liberia has been defeating uh, the odds as the elections have remained relatively calm and peaceful. Um, some violence did occur. Um, there was the harassment of, of women as long lines of voter queues uh, established themselves um, on election day. There's some minor incidents as well in terms of destruction of, of campaign materials, campaign posters uh, during the campaign period, and a few isolated cases of inter-party violence, uh, particularly in Nimba County. But overall, uh, the violence has been minimal, that's for sure. Uh, as already was indicated, the voter turnout was about 72%, uh, percent, similar to previous presidential elections in, uh, in Liberia. Uh, and the NEC was initially applauded for the transparent counting procedures, for the timely pronouncement of election results. Um, but however, there were some challenges that were indicated uh, in with the voter roll, um, poor queue management, and the quality of poll workers. But overall, again, a very positive uh, performance that uh, was given to, uh, attributed to, to, to the NEC. Uh, Unity Party candidates uh, Boakai and George Weah of the uh, Coalition for Democratic Change came out on top, respectively 28.8 and 38.4% of the vote. So it was looking as if we were heading for a runoff between these two candidates, but the Supreme Court uh, decided otherwise. Uh, as was already indicated, I won't go into depth because it's already covered. Uh, but Charles Brumskin of the Liberty Party, who ended third in the first round election, he filed a complaint with the Unity Party as a co-complainant. Um, and these, there were claims that there were massive irregularities, as was already uh, indicated. Um, the Supreme Court then prohibited the NEC from organizing the runoff until a thorough investigation of the complaint was conducted. Now, I'll add a brief word as well on the legacy of, of President Sirleaf, which I think is important also to add a little bit of, of perspective, uh, as well as her role in the current elections. I think it's an important um, contribution to make in events in Washington, D.C., perhaps, and to draw people's attention to the contrast that there is between the international praise for, for President Sirleaf and her popularity at home. Surely, there's no doubt that Liberia has experienced a remarkable level of political stability in the past 14 years under the presidency of, of President Sirleaf. Uh, access to electricity, clean water has significantly improved. She's attracted new foreign investments. Uh, she was the fir first female head of uh, state in Africa. And uh, importantly, in these elections, she decided not to run again. Um, this may therefore be the first uh, democratic transition of power since uh, 1944. But at home, there is still some disgruntlement, not just with uh, the person of, of President uh, Sirleaf, but also with her party. Uh, after all, Liberia remains one of the uh, least developed countries on earth. Um, people complain about unemployment and, and poor infrastructure. And many Liberians also do not forget about her initial promise to remain a one-term president, and the fact that she ignored the advice of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Committee. Um, so why, in the end, wrapping up, um, will peace prevail, or has peace prevailed so, thus far, despite those risk factors? I think there's uh, the war fatigue is, can certainly be uh, attributed in part to this, um, the lack of willingness to pick up arms for politicians. Uh, I think there is a growing uh, level of trust in Liberian institutions, uh, which is promising, which keeps people from perhaps settling disputes in the streets and uh, deciding them and, and being willing to bring them up in, in court. Uh, and I think, f finally, what, what may also be a cause of, of the, the relative stability is the success uh, of uh, violence prevention efforts. And there's several that I'll, I'll briefly point to. The survey that we conducted, and we, we did um, survey-based research, um, we conducted over a thousand surveys and uh, nationwide interviews with the long-term observers. Um, it indicated that election monitoring, peace messaging, and civic education were the most widely used prevention instruments. Um, the LNP also reached out to vulnerable communities. They engaged youth, even the motorcycle unions. 
Um, but it does seem that the respondents in our survey they indicated that police were rarely present um, to prevent election violence or, or the risk thereof in certain uh, instances. And that building a capable, and that's perhaps a suggestion that I would have for the next government, uh, it's building a capable and professional police force remains a priority to win back the trust of the Liberian uh, people in order to help ensure election security in the years to come. Um, in the question and answer uh, session, I'd also be happy to, to comment perhaps on the role of observation missions, which I think is particularly interesting in light of the criticism that international observers have received in the Kenya elections. I do think that there's quite a few parallels to be drawn between the recent Kenya elections and the Liberia elections. And I think leading politicians have also drawn some lessons from uh, the developments uh, in, in Kenya. Uh, and then finally, the role of diplomacy. Uh, only 17% of Liberians think that foreign diplomats were able to influence local leaders. Um, of course, these are perception-based indications, but uh, these are much lower numbers that you see in, in other countries, and they really surprised me, given the very prominent presence of UNMIL in the past and the prominent presence of, of the U.S. Embassy in country. Uh, the U.N. mission in Liberia was considered the most influential diplomatic presence, followed by the U.S. Embassy in ECOWAS. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that, and uh, thank you all. Thank you, Yunus. Uh, that was a good overview of the elections. Some of you may not have been following it that closely, and so that gives a good background. And we'll go more into a practical uh, experience with Liberia in our next speakers. And uh, first, I'd like to call on uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who's now retired from the State Department and a distinguished fellow at Georgetown University. Uh, she is someone that, as a former State Department person myself, that we always really looked up to, and she held every high position in the State Department that it's possible for a professional to hold. And I won't say that that's not why she's not there now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, please go ahead. You may sit down. Okay, if, I think I'd prefer to stand sure. just because I have, uh, I'm dealing with a foot that sure. is not feeling good sitting there. Okay. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, let me uh, start by thanking uh, Friends of Liberia. Uh, Friends of Liberia have always been here for Liberia for so many years. You said 30 years, and you've been with Liberia through thick and, and thin. And uh, this effort is just one more signal uh, to uh, the world how important Liberia is to you and to all of us who care about Liberia. I'd also like to start by giving you a little bit of context. Uh, as you know, I was the ambassador in Liberia, but I have been engaged with Liberia uh, since my mid-20s. Uh, I went to Liberia as a graduate student to do research in the 1970s, and like many of the Peace Corps volunteers in this room, I fell in love with the country. And so uh, uh, to return after 30 years as the ambassador uh, was a, a, an amazing uh, experience for me. But I've been involved in Liberia for almost 40 years, and I witnessed Liberia going through its many evolutions, if I would just go back to when I was there in 78 and when I left in 1979, and we know what happened in 1980, and, uh, and uh, on and on. Uh, I re rejoiced with all of you and with all, all Liberians at the conclusion of the peace deal in 2003. Uh, the war went on way too long. It had a devastating impact on the country. Uh, Liberia's historic elections in, in 2006 uh, was really an amazing feat, not just because Liberia elected the first woman uh, to be president of Africa. That was a, a big deal, but it was because Liberians elected a president. They actually elected a president, and one that was uh, in an election that was viewed uh, as free and fair, um, and mostly peaceful. And more importantly, uh, the Liberian people voted. I was there. Uh, I watched uh, people as an observer uh, standing in line at 3 o'clock in the morning waiting for the election. It rained that night, uh, and they stood in the rain. 
and they stood in the mud, and then the sun came out and they stood in the heat uh, so that they could vote. Uh, it was a sign that Liberia was on, on its way to, uh, to change. And they voted uh, and they staked the claim in a future peaceful Liberia. So now here we are 12 years later. Uh, we find ourselves once again in what I'd like to refer to as a crisis of conscience and a crisis of leadership in Liberia. On October 10th, Liberians again went to the polls. They went with tremendous confidence and they voted. 70%, I just heard you say. Um, they unfortunately had to make a choice between personalities and not issues. And there were 20 personalities. That still gives me palpitations that in a country the size of Liberia, people have to vote between 20 different personalities who are not talking about issues, uh, but are talking about uh, themselves. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I, I consider myself as Liberian as anyone else here. I feel like I'm in the family, and I will always tell Liberians like I think it is. And if they don't like it, they don't like each other, and they don't like me. So that's OK, because we all talk to each other uh, in, in a very serious way. So they had to choose between 20 candidates. And I don't think it was easy to go to the polls and try to decide what, which one of the 20 candidates you would select. But over 2 million of them voted. Uh, and again, estimated to be 70% of the population, uh, of the voting population. And they came out with two clear winners. Uh, and so they were ready for in my view, a second round. Uh, the election, as you heard from our embassy, and I agree with that, the election was peaceful. Uh, and the election was considered generally free and fair. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. Ours are not perfect. Uh, but it was generally considered uh, a free and fair election by all of the international observers, and I think by most Liberians, to be very, very honest with you. So far, so good. But um, the results were challenged. And a decision was taken by the Supreme Court uh, to delay the uh, next round of the election. And uh, that has put this country in a crisis. Uh, the challenge was made by the third place candidate, who only got under 10%. A third place candidate who has run three times before and never got more than 10%. And so that challenge, and then once he won in the Supreme Court, everybody else jumped on the bandwagon. And so here we are. We know uh, that, uh, we don't know when there's going to be election. I hope, James, as you said, there's, they'll make a decision uh, by next week. Uh, that there will be an election and when the election uh, will be. Uh, because the people deserve that. They earn that right to vote for the two choices that, uh, that they made. And what we do know is that come January, I think it's January 18th, Sirleaf is gone. Uh, she's not decided to stay again. She had the right to run a second term. I know she said she wouldn't, but she never tried to change the Constitution to run a third term, as far as I know. And she certainly, we know she didn't. Uh, so come January 18th, Liberians have to transition. And if they don't have an election, they won't have a transition. And we will have a constitutional crisis uh, in this country. And this is, it's untenable. And it's unfair to, to the Liberian people who put their trust in their leaders. And they are being failed by, by those leaders uh, because of personality competitions. Uh, Liberia had a chance, uh, and it still does have a chance to, to make history, uh, to actually have a transfer of power from one democratically elected president to the next democratically elected president if the second round uh, is allowed to, to take place. Liberia has a chance to continue 
to earn the respect of the international community and earn the respect of the region. Nobody wants to see Liberia start to, to go backward. Uh, whoever the newly elected president, if allowed to be elected, can start a process of making his, and it is his, contribution to moving Liberia's agenda uh, forward. Uh, they have the responsibility to build on and improve on Sir Leaf's legacy. And Sir Leaf does have a legacy. Uh, they need to learn from her mistakes. She did make mistakes. She wasn't perfect. And they need to build a legacy for themselves for the next generation. So Liberia's leaders have, in my view, failed the people of this poor country who look to them for leadership and look to them for building a future for their children. My question to Liberian leaders is, what's wrong with you? I mean, you're, you have a responsibility. The problem, this problem that we have today should not exist in Liberia. Uh, the people spoke, and they deserve the opportunity to speak again and elect their chosen leader. Now, let me be clear. Uh, I don't have a horse in this race. Uh, I used to say when I was in Liberia before that my candidate was democracy. In this case, my candidate is democracy, but my candidate is also whomever the people choose in a free and fair election. Now, sometimes the choices that voters make are not always the best choices for those of you who voted in our election. Um, they don't always vote for the person that those of us who think we're smarter than, than others, they don't vote for the person that we think ought to be the president. So the Liberian people will vote. And whoever they elect, every single one of us, every Liberian in this room, every member of Friends of Liberia, every friend of Liberia, every bilateral uh, partner of Liberia has the responsibility to try to help that new president succeed, whoever, whichever uh, one is, is elected, because that person will be the choice of the Liberian people. Now, if you told me to select a president, I'd select one for you. But that's not how it works. People get to vote. Uh, so my hope is that all Liberians find a way to uh, get past this current crisis uh, and to continue on their very shaky, at very, very shaky and unstable path of democracy. <clears throat> They're on the path of democracy. Democracy is not a, a perfect uh, institution, but it is continually improving. It self improves over time, and sometimes there are setbacks as we have seen even in our, in our own country. Uh, but Liberians can't go backward. Liberians don't have the, the time to go backward. Liberians have to go forward. Uh, when so many people around the world are rooting for this country, this country has to show that they are ready to continue on the path of democracy. I look forward to your questions. Do musical chairs? No. <laughs> you can see why uh, Ambassador <coughs> Thomas Greenfield uh, was our draw for today. She has the background and the eloquence to say so much uh, that's on all of our minds. And she speaks as a Liberian, as she said, uh, but she'll use the personal pronoun. Uh, she's not speaking anymore in her role in the U.S. State Department. She's speaking as part of the Liberian family. And I, I think that's what makes the difference between someone who uh, kind of preaches at others and someone who's part of a family and just wants to try to find the best for everyone. Let's move on to uh, Assistant Professor Welma Red. Uh, she is at Morgan Morgan State University, and she uh, has a background in Liberia. As a Liberian woman, she was outstanding as a journalist with the Liberian Broadcasting System, and she also uh, worked in the West African um, Union, right, 
Man Mano River Union, that's right, and uh, is now doing a lot of, of projects with cinema and other things, and um, she'll speak to us about what she sees as some of the important things that need to be taken care of in Liberia from her perspective. And it's a perspective uh, of journalism in Liberia. As most of you know, um, it's very important that we have a strong press. Without a strong press, what is often called the fourth estate, you have your three branches of government, and there's the press that can be very instrumental in helping people see what's going on, uh, decide on, uh, make decisions based on the facts that maybe the government may not be willing to share so readily. So you have a, a press that is shining light on areas that may not be often available to people through the government. So it's important that the press is reliable, the press is giving valid information, the press can be trusted to provide the information to the public that will help the public form their opinions, vote, and you know decide who to put their votes behind and so forth and so on. Um, I want to say, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately in Liberia, we do not have that strength in our press for several reasons, and some of them I might touch on. Um, besides that, you know, Liberia has a complicated history. And over the years, from its foundation, Liberia has been having these political ups and downs. E.J. Roy, that was the first coup. So from the very start, uh, people were trying to dislodge what was supposed to be the democratic way, what the Constitution requires. People have tried to skirt it, and the candidates that have been either voted for have been tried to be denied the um, right to, to enjoy the, the vote that they, they earned. And um, so we had that, the crisis in, in, in Liberia. And then, you know, after Roy, there was also the other one with um, Barclay and them in the Fernandopol issue where the president was again in trouble for not doing things as right as uh, you know people thought they should be. And then, of course, we come all into the years of the, the Coleman a coup, at, I mean, um, it, it was a coup that was alleged, let's say, William David Coleman. Again, there, there was supposed to be a coup there. And then there was a Fambule coup. There again was supposed to be a coup there. And then, of course, we went to the Flanzamin, well, before the Flanzamin, we had a real coup. I mean, we had the military coup that brought Doe in. And then the Flatsamenton thing, and then finally we are where we are. And as the ambassador rightly said, we are on the verge of a constitutional, political, national crisis. Regardless of how we would like the elections to go, we need our press to try and tell the story clearly. Fairly, uh, what I would like to do is to to give some recommendations um, as to how perhaps going forward we could strengthen the press. I mean, a lot of work is being done in Liberia already. Um, the U.S. USAID and other institutions, the German Dutch uh, group, and the European Union, they are funding a lot of programs to help the press. 
But there are other things that maybe can still be done so that uh, the press is a strong instrument for promoting democracy, which is absolutely necessary. Um, some of my um, recommendations include the elimination of the criminal libel law that, and other laws that um, stifle the media. I mean, the press is not perfect in Liberia, especially since they are not, the entrepreneurial skills of our press may not be strong enough, and they don't have, uh, uh, the, the, like the press here in many countries, they are financially uh, independent. Our press is not. Oftentimes, they depend on government um, contracts. They be, depend on United Nations contracts and so forth and so on. Other contracts to survive it depend on government contracts. So we need to strengthen the press, um, not making libel law, especially where it pertains to public figures. If the press says something about a, a government official, uh, wherever they are, they shouldn't be arrested. They should not be put in jail. They should not be fined. We've seen incidents of that throughout our history. Um, we need to also uh, uh, use tougher standards, you know, with these public figure libel cases. And there's a bill called the Table Mountain. Uh, Pro Table Mountain is where all the African countries went and met and said, we're going to uh, support a free press by uh, 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 eliminating these laws. We also need to um, partner with government and safeguard national security against some of these incursions. We need to, for the, for the police and the army, they need to understand the role of the press and respect that. We need to help our press be more economically strengthened. And, and I will stop there. But there are a number of things that can be done to help the press do a better job in Liberia in promoting democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wilma. Um, it, we'll have a lot of questions for you afterwards because you touched on an, a couple of things that uh, certainly um, can be very practical and then the implication of the media getting so much support from foreign sources and what influence that has on what they do can also be important. I would like to introduce uh, to you Emma Ar Arcodia. Um, Emma is from Search for Common Ground, which is one of my favorite NGOs, I have to say. Uh, I worked with Search for Common Ground when I was in Liberia, and some of my best friends worked for Search for Common Ground. And I, I think they've done wonderful work in Liberia. And I do think that NGOs play an essential role in Liberia. Uh, and I think we have to, to really look at those. And I, I'd like you to address, in general, the, the role in democracy building that they play. Thank you. Thank you, Zaira. And um, yes, I will. I will start from there, and I will. Um, I will provide an insight of what civil society can do to promote uh, peace consolidation beyond the political transition. Um, so the new government uh, will have to manage. Will have two challenges after. Uh, the political transition. One is uh, the change of government itself, and the second is the end, uh, the end of the United Nations mission in Liberia's mandate. Um, and to do this, uh, it will need to uh, communicate effectively and strategically which step it will take in order to maintain peace. And, um, and at the same time, build trust uh, among citizens beyond Monserrado County. 
Um, and to, and uh, civil society can play a key role uh, in uh, strengthening uh, civil, in strengthening citizens' trust in institution, as well as in supporting the uh, in supporting the government in maintaining peace and then tr triggering development. Um, framework for uh, uh, support for supporting peace and consolidating peace are already there. They have been drafted, uh, namely uh, the Agenda for Transformation Vision 2030, uh, the 2017 uh, Peace Building Plan, as well as the 2012 Strategic ro Roadmap for uh, Healing and Reconciliation. Um, however, those uh, those agenda have not been um, implemented, or they've been acted upon uh, partially. Um, so it is important to uh, to to go back to to each county to work together uh, with the, with citizen in order to understand what are their grievances, and um, in order to have the government respond to those grievances, um, and. Uh, um, to do so, it is important to, um, uh, the, for the new government to focus on two main priorities. The first priority is reconciliation, and the second priority is uh, security sector reform. Um, for reconciliation um, to be a priority, because we see even even though the election didn't um, didn't experience too much violence, but there were some cases of uh, um, of tensions between uh, um, that were along ethnic lines. Uh, for instance, in Sino County, county uh, between uh, Sarpo and and crew um, and crew ethnic groups. Um, so it is important, and those, the, despite the fact that these kind of co these distinctions were triggered by uh, by the elections, they were uh, they were um, dated to deep rooted in uh, in um, in the in the civil war in the past in the past 50 years of an uh, um, not accomplished reconciliation. So it is really important to, uh, in order to achieve peace, to look back. To go back, look at what were the conflict that triggered the civil war, and uh, and then uh, heal the um, heal citizens and heal um, Liberian society. And second is um, the second priority, as I uh, mentioned earlier, is security sector reform. Um, Search for Common Ground, together with the United Nations Mission in Liberia, conducted a study called the Social um, Social Cohesion uh, uh, and Reconciliation Index. And uh, we were able to see that 77% of the population uh, acknowledged the Liberian National Police to be um, the one to turn to in case of violence. But at the same time, they, um, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't feel the Liberian National Police was able to face the violence they were, um, uh, sh they, they were asked to, uh, to face. Uh, and therefore, it is important um, for, for the new government to invest more in training, in skill building, as well as in uh, trust building between citizens and, uh, and, and police um, officers. And, uh, and we see civil society to, to play a key role in this, uh, because uh, as, um, uh, as my colleagues may um, also uh, confirm, uh, community-based um, initiatives have been able to keep peace in, uh, in Liberia. Uh, the, the, com the peace committee in all uh, in, uh, in many counties have been able to um, uh, to go back and uh, to go back and look at tensions among uh, um, ethnic groups and at the, at the at the grassroots level solve those problems um, or like the Palava hut uh, system or um, even the peace building the the the, commu the the peace committee that have been able to cooperate with the peace building office to uh, identify early warning of violence uh, during the election and beyond in order to uh, prevent them and, and stop violence uh, at the, um, when it was able to be, when it, we, we would be able to, to stop it. So as you can see, security sector and reconciliation are key issues that the new government should, should consider. And then finally, um, two recommendations that I would, that I would give um, uh, following the security sector and reconciliation as key priorities, uh, the importance uh, uh, of uh, maintaining freedom of speech and freedom of press, as uh, my colleague in the panel said, as well as 
um, uh, making sure that grassroots level organization as well as citizen are taken into consideration in the um, in in the post uh, election period when the government will be uh, drafting new policies uh, for peace building and development. So it's, it's really key uh, to listen to citizens, to their grievances, in order to make sure that the policies uh, that are um, acted upon uh, actually respond to Liberia's needs. Thank you, Anna. I'm, I think that's a good uh, well, all of them are good points, but the involvement of civil society in the development of the plans of the new government, I think, would go a long way to helping them feel in involved. It's, there's going to be a lot of people, no matter what, that are disappointed in the outcome of the elections. And that's going to be certainly a management situation for uh, the new government to deal with and to try to get them to buy into the programs that that they come up with. And we know that because Liberia is so dependent on foreign assistance that uh, donors are going to look at that and they're going to try to see are the citizens really having a voice in this new government. So we will... Um, soon open it up to questions. If somebody could pass, if you could pass the cards that you may have written to the side, um, let's say to this side, and then we'll, um, we'll pick them up and I'll take the questions first that are written and then we'll open it up to others. But while this is going on, do you have questions of each other that you would like to address? Use your microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, James, I would love to hear from you what ordinary people are saying. Uh, how are they responding to this delay in the, uh, in the election, in the runoff? Uh, Use the micro. It's two. But there's one right there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Turned it off. This on? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think you said something that was very important, and that is... Uh, the whole challenge has put a damper in the way the general public is feeling about the election. But overall, the, everyone has been kind of peaceful, but also underneath the peacefulness is this anxiousness. Um, so, but uh, um, I, my discussion, my interview with George Weir, and, and every time you talk to them, I think he kept repeating, all his people, they kept repeating that uh, the people should continue to remain peaceful. Uh, and so far, I think it's been peaceful um, because uh, I think people are worried that if this process is not handled uh, correctly, the country could be set on fire. So, but every, so far, everybody has been very peaceful. And they, uh, people are anxious. They want to get it over with. They want to go and vote. Um, so hopefully that uh, maybe with the developments in the Supreme Court. Uh, so I was talking to the Election Commission. The statement by the, um, the U.S. Embassy also, the Election Commission was telling me last night that every paper in Liberia carried that statement as their front story. That showed the kind of way that people want to move forward. They just want to move forward with the whole process. And at the same time, people, they appreciate the legal process taking its course. They appreciate the legal process taking its course, and that people have the right to a challenge, and then let it process, the challenge go through the legal process. So they also appreciate that. But overall, they just want to move forward, go to the polls, and get it over with. That's why this statement by the US Embassy plays so uh, highly in the papers and on the radio in like on the radio and television in Liberia. Thank you. We'll go to these questions and then but I would like you to feel free to ask each other questions as well. Um, there's a question why did President Johnson Sirleaf call a meeting at her house with the NEC leadership and UN reps? A second question is, is it customary in a democratic 
election for a few few days, let's see, to the elections for a sitting president to invite an elective commission and you in top executive to his or her home. Would anyone like to try to address that? <laughs> I don't think we can. <laughs> I, you know I don't think we can speculate. Because she, she gave me the first question, so I want to give her the second one. <laughs> <laughs> it should be on. Look, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it probably didn't help uh, the situation uh, that, uh, that that was done. But she is the sitting president. And the Electoral Commission uh, is is hers. It probably shouldn't have happened in her home. It should have happened if she was going to have a meeting, a public meeting with the UN to explain it. It should have happened in the Electoral Commission's office or in a much more public uh, in a much more public forum. Uh, but it's not for me to second guess uh, her on on that decision. If you ask me if I would have done it, I'd say no. But. Uh, I don't know that that's the reason that we're in this crisis today. Thank you. A question, will America live up to its promises from this colonization society of 1816 <laughs> to 1860? You know, I'll take that one. And I'll take it because, I'll, I'll take it because once I gave a speech in Liberia, and I said, the only promise the American Colonization Society made to Liberia is they didn't want the people who were sent back to Liberia. And so the fact that people kept going back to promises, the promise was for the people to go back to Liberia. And I know there were all kinds of things there. But, and there were all kinds of motives and different goals within the American Colonization Society for why people supported the organization's efforts for people to come back to Liberia. But for me, as an African American, it just said they didn't want African Americans in the states. And this was a way of sending them back home to places that were not their own. So I don't know that we can hold the American Colonization Society accountable for whatever people believe they may have committed to in 1820 uh, or 1821. Well, I would like to add to that um, the, the ACS when they made the decisions and put in their funds to, to help people go back, there were lots of African Americans who paid their own money, bought their freedom, freedom of their entire families. I mean, look at someone like John Brown Rusrum. He was already a big guy here. He wrote the first, he, uh, the first African American newspaper the Freedom's Journal, he was big stuff, college graduate back in 18 something, and he went to Liberia. So it's not about a promise from the Americans. Where is our promise to ourselves? I would say that it's high time we as Liberians start to look for values in our own society. And we cannot base our values along tribal lines or ethnic lines until we are ready to bridge all those uh, 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 barriers and bring them down. Uh, the dichotomy between those who are in America and who are uh, so-called Americans now and those who are in Liberia, those kinds of things cannot be used to further people's personal goals and destroy the country. We need to be more committed and build our own promise, each of us. Uh, I see a lot of Liberians in the audience. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, when I say us, I'm talking to the Liberians. Each of us has to decide to make our promise to Liberia and make it known in Liberia. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm going to go through these really quickly because I do want to respect each person that, that wrote these. Um, what do you make of key players 
of the Liberian Civil War serving in positions of power and being kingmakers in the elections. How does this affect or influence our already fragile democracy? Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I know people say that, but we've gone 12 years with people who fought in the war serving in the government, 12 years. And so, um, again, if it's part of the democratic process, then let it be. So if those people are elected by the people, some of the people I didn't even know they fought in the war, and then when I come to read the history, they say, well, this person was in the war. But if the person is elected by the people, then we, we have to respect that. So um, it, it, it's um, like somebody was telling me, I, we are, I was talking to We Are and say, um, and so We Are, why did you talk to Charles Taylor? And then, you know, it's just like making wise decision now. Like, so, and whether that will have an influence in what he's going to do or whoever is elected president, um, it's just like the president meeting with the election commission. Did that have any influence on would I have any influence on what the results would be? We don't know. But the point is that um, we are saying uh, that's not going to, I don't have the power to bring Charles Taylor from where he is. I may have met with him, uh, but I don't have the power to, I may have talked to him, I mean, but I don't have the power to bring him to Liberia. So that, that, the people were elected. Prince Johnson was elected twice. He was elected twice. And Prince Johnson played a, a big role in the Civil War. So uh, many people in the government. So if that is part of democracy, I can't, I can't say anything about that. We, because you cannot deny the people the right, the democratic right as Liberians to contest. Unless there's uh, an international law to say that, or a Liberian law to say they cannot run. So that's the way I see it. Thank you. Anyone else want to make a short comment? There was another question about uh, what could be said about George Weah's contribution to peace in Liberia. And I think you mentioned already that he and other candidates have all, have all spoken out that they want this to be a peaceful process and that all Liberians should honor and respect that. I, I think what, what he said. What he said in that interview was that he said that the people who are challenging the results, if only they knew his role, what he did to bring peace. And he goes back to the, two, the last two elections. That's what he, he's talking about. These, some of these people are challenging, challenging the result. They don't know what we did to bring peace. I don't know what he did so far about holding his people down. That's what he's telling. He said, if he didn't do it, there, will, there was going to be trouble after the election. So he said he played a role after each election to bring peace to Liberia. So I think he's a little bit, he was a little bit angry with the people challenging. But I mean, the people have the right to challenge the results. Thank you. Uh, the rule of law is essential to upholding peace in Liberia, and it is paramount that the current government of Liberia is held accountable. Oops. What has your organization done to ensure this effort? <laughs> I guess that means Friends of Liberia. <laughs> um, Friends of Liberia stays nonpartisan. We want to be able to work with any uh, elected government and to be able to try to affect um, positive change especially in the areas of education, of health, and the rule of law. So we try to stay out of situations that would appear to be uh, favoring one party o over the other. And I'm, I'm saying this, I'm just brainstorming this as I talk with you, and I invite my colleagues to respond. But in general, because of our mission and our values, the programs that we support uh, definitely support the rule of law. And we have assisted lawyers, uh, especially during the time that Congress was holding hearings about what was going on during the war in Liberia. 
Um, we had representation to support peace efforts. And so the rule of law is very important. But as far as holding a particular person accountable, which is, I think, what this question may be trying to get to, I, I don't see our role at this time as doing that. But uh, we certainly invite your feedback as to how we might do that in a uh, nonpartisan way. What does the split within the UP and the post-complaint coalition formation say about the UP legacy and the president, current president? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to tackle that uh, question. I think it says a lot about um, uh, capacity and in institution building. Uh, it says a lot about leadership, uh, that uh, the Unity Party was not able to live by its name, Unity, uh, and stay together to uh, continue to uh, contribute to, to Liberia's future. Uh, so it was uh, unfortunate, I think, that, uh, that the party was not able to, to work as, as one. And I think that's part of the reason we're um, in this crisis right now. That goes to another question. Uh, what can be done to change from personality politics to campaigning on the issues? I know that um, one of my old friends, Raymond Zarbi, was trying to host various debates with the candidates. And uh, some people participated, and, and many did not. Uh, it, it seemed as if people didn't really want to talk about the issues. Yeah, part of it is having 20 candidates and their briefcase uh, politicians uh, who are carrying their campaign literature around uh, in their briefcases. <laughs> uh, and they run so that they can get their 1 or 2 or 3 or 5 percent and use it as leverage uh, with the other candidates. So I think the Liberian Constitution or or the legislature should determine that uh, there, should, uh, there should be only four, four parties. And that will force people to come together. Because right now, everybody votes based on ethnic or regional um, uh, allegiances in that first round of the election. And so if you didn't have 20 candidates, you probably wouldn't need a second round because somebody would get the 50 plus 1% needed to, uh, to get elected. Uh, so again, if I, if I were uh, king or queen of Liberia, I would just say four candidates and figure a way to come together uh, to, uh, to get the Liberian people to vote for your platform and not for your person. Although I must say that uh, this particular election, the first round, a group um, uh, did, a, did a research and they, I mean, a survey, and they came down with uh, having some kind of a presidential debate, I think, for the first time. Presidential debate among the six candidates that they thought the people were, I mean, chose in that survey. And so, um, so they had a first debate, uh, although George we did not take part. And so um, you mentioned personality. And so, and so it's the fact that the results came out and he was, you know, he took the lead. So was that, was that based on his personality or was it based on the, the fact that he didn't show up to discuss the issue? But I said an attempt was made this time around by having that debate. Of, of course, the second time the vice president, they, he boycotted also because I don't know why. But um, you know, they, they made an attempt to make sure that the issues are discussed, except that they, they, some of the candidates chose, the main candidates chose not to take part. If I may briefly add to that, I think that this is not an issue that's a problem that's unique to Liberia. And you see increasingly that around the world, there's mm -hmm. been a, a shift from issue-based politics towards personality-based politics, even in very mature democracies. I think that if this is a primary concern, 
then you're, you're well off as, as a country. Then if I'm, I'm sure there's other fish that need to be fried first uh, before we can even reach that stage. But I think it's, it's an important issue because it, it, it heightens tension and it creates a, a fluid nature of politics where people will move parties, they'll leave parties, create new parties, and, and certainly that, that has something uh, to deal with it. And if I may briefly uh, go back to a point that was, that was made earlier um, by, by Emma about the role of civil society, I think that there are many ways through which civil society can engage uh, to promote democracy, to promote peaceful elections, um, there's, there's youth programming. I think that there's a lot of good work being done in, in uh, Liberia by organizations like NAMOTI, which really promotes the next generation of politicians, bring people together. There's a lot of work being done by civil society uh, in terms of civic education, educating people about what the role of democracy is and what the responsibility of citizens in a democracy is. Um, peace messaging is also a, a large component of, of what's being conducted by the media, uh, by others that, that, that call for restraint and encourage people to engage peacefully in these elections. But what I will say is, in order for these types of initiatives to be effective, they need to start early and they need to be sustained across election cycles. Because if you think about the logic behind these programs, they try to change attitudes and behavior of a broad segment of the electorate. And you can, simply cannot do that in two or three months. Uh, fortunately, you see that a lot of the election programming starts rather late, because that's when the funds become available, and they end soon after the elections. It's important for this type of election programming to be sustained, and only that way you can really change attitudes and behavior in the long term. Thank you. And I would like to again add that um, uh, the, the, the problem is perhaps systemic and it runs throughout the society. So using the media, now when, when I say media, I don't just mean press, I mean drama groups, um, television, radio, everything. Using the media to get the citizens involved in a very sustained manner, not for elections only, right? We need to be involved in building a cohesive society over a long period of time, a society that's interested, again, in values that we all can share. We need to have a building of not only supporting press, but supporting the civil society. Uh, media has to be used as the voice of the people. And let's use the voice for everything good that we can bring to the society, not just for elections. But let's make the society better. Thank you. Thank you. Emma. To add quickly, yeah. I think there the key is access to information. And uh, when, when citizens have the opportunity to listen to their candidates in the constituency, at the national level, and listen how also they talk among each other, that is, is the key to change voting along ethnic lines and shifting towards uh, voting along shared interests. And it seems to work. We have done a, um, a randomized control trial of this kind of debate in Sierra Leone, and it worked. We, we, we can say that uh, voting along uh, ethnic lines is not an immutable rule. It can be changed. So I'm sure that in the future, we can see also in Liberia something like that. I know that um, Search for Common Ground has that as one of their objectives, and so I hope you can always can be sustainable. Um, education is a theme that goes through everything that, that you all are saying, and we know that that's a major uh, element of a successful society. So one of the questions is, um, what is the direction of education in Liberia? Is the Bridge Academy uh, effect sustainable, or do, do you foresee something totally different happening? Does everyone know what that's about? Um, it's the use of a, a private 
company under contract to the government to uh, try to correct deficiencies in education using primarily the media, uh, digital media. I don't know because uh, the, that uh, I, I was talking the other day with the the Minister of Education. I don't know whether he's in or he's out. He's in and out, so he's almost going out or he's staying in. But so I, I guess what I was trying to get from him was the Minister. Uh, don't you think it's about time to give the Liberian people um, a comprehensive report in terms of how this program that you introduced, how it went the first year and how it's going? Um, so far, I have not, I've been communicating with the minister by text, but he has not been able to come on to come to answer how the program went in this first year. Uh, everybody know it was controversial when it was introduced. There are some people who felt that, uh, you know, the, 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 there should be a role for the Liberian government when you want to talk, when you talk about public education, and that they, some people felt that this system may deprive other students of the privilege to learn, to get better education. So I really want, maybe this is a reminder for me to keep pushing the minister, but these days now, so you don't know whether the minister is in or he's out. So when you try to talk to them, they can't answer you directly because they have to be careful what they are saying. But I will keep pushing him to see if we can get a, a, a report because I think he owes it to the Liberian people to tell them how that project went. And I suppose that a, a new president may or may not want to continue that. There's not a long-term contract obligation with funding, right? as far as I know. Can I just comment on that a bit? And I don't know much uh, about this, but I know that the education system in Liberia as it exists has failed Liberians, and that it's necessary to think out of the box, uh, to look at different ways and try them. And if they work, fine. And if they don't work, let's try something else. Nobody is saying that Liberians should go back to using landlines because you never had landlines. Uh, everybody has moved a generation ahead uh, to using cell phones. Uh, the uh, regular classroom system has not educated Liberians. Liberians were all failing the uh, West Africa exams uh, across the board, except for a few schools in Liberia and a few students. So uh, while people have criticized this, they need to see whether it's had some impact and what impact it has had. So if it's improving education for young people, then uh, let's look at this. Let's look at some other out of the box ways for making sure that the very youthful population of Liberia gets an opportunity for, uh, for education so that they can compete in the world. One of the questions uh, is, what is the status of Peace Corps programs in Liberia, and what is their role, and what should they not do? It kind of ties in with this a little bit in my mind, because uh, most Peace Corps volunteers are in the education sector, and some in health. And in years past, when there were large, large numbers of volunteers, they were also in community development and did a lot of infrastructure work. Some people feel that having Peace Corps volunteers as teachers uh, displaces the responsibility of the government and the nation uh, because they think, OK, I don't have to hire 200 teachers. I'm going to get them from Peace Corps. Uh, do you feel that that feeling is a reality in Liberia? Or uh, do those of you who have either been volunteers or no volunteers? Do you feel that, that they are, in fact, maybe a teaching element um, to, to help train teachers that are undertrained? Over uh, nearly, gosh, uh, since the 60s, since the 60s uh, Peace Corps volunteers have been going to Liberia, and many of them have been teachers. And many prominent Liberians 
who are in positions of authority or just successful in whatever they're doing all have a Peace Corps teacher experience. So I don't think Peace Corps interferes with the government's ability to hire teachers. I think if governments can hire all the teachers they need, then Peace Corps volunteers would do something else. Uh, they can't hire all the qualified teachers that, uh, that they need uh, because all the qualified teachers are not there. And uh, Peace Corps contributes to educating uh, librarians and I think we should give all Peace Corps volunteers a hand of applause. Because those of us who went to, you know, when I was in school in Liberia, we had Peace Corps and we had Liberian teachers. So it did not, uh, yeah, so I think they, they, it should continue. Uh, if they can all learn from each other. So you need a Liberian teachers, you need Peace Corps, that's okay. It's definitely a two-way street. Yeah. I know I've learned more from the people I worked with in the health ministry than I gave back, but uh, hopefully I still left something with them. Um, just for your information, the Friends of Liberia is trying a new approach in preschool education to try to help uh, young Liberians be ready to go to school uh, because that has not existed for the, uh, it may have existed for the elite Liberians, but not for your average Liberian that lives in Painesville or New Crewtown or someplace like that. Uh, we will be happy to talk to you about that program, what we're doing there during our refreshment period, uh, because we're real proud of the results that we've gotten in the first couple of years working with a nonprofit group in Liberia called We Care. Um, and it needs replication all over the country, which we can't do, but it's a, a great program so far with what they call evidence-based proof. Means you do better at the last test than you did at the first test. Um, I think one of this question, um, what happened to the 88,000 people that did not vote during this election? Uh, I think we've alluded to that with the fact that everybody needs to be brought into this runoff and made part of the new government through civil society efforts, through the media. Um, how do you consider the behavior of the presiding officer that has a pre-marked ballot. I think if, uh, if we were to know that, hopefully the person would be reported and investigated. Um, does anyone else have an answer to that? I, I think that some of those issues, that, and they are the now at the center of the challenge uh, that was filed by these four parties, and the um, Elections Commission has looked into those claims. Um, I think also part of this is about education. I know the day before the election, uh, Commissioner Kokoya was on my program, and he stressed one thing in that interview that morning, on the day that the people were supposed to be voting, to so say, listen, if you don't know, or if you've forgotten where you're supposed to be voting, this is the process you need to go through so that we can tell you right away before tomorrow comes where you're supposed to be voting. And they encourage everybody to use their cell phone to do that in case you forget where you're supposed to be. Uh, and do not claim that because you have a voting car that you can go and vote in this election. It must be about this election. Certain things were outlined, uh, and I think this is where education comes in. Maybe some people overlooked it. They were into the heat of this process, and they forgot to do what they were supposed to do. And probably they show up on the day of election, and then they found out that they could not vote. Maybe that's one problem for this, uh, this problem that we are having, one cause of the problem. But I think uh, those, those they were foreseen, and the, the election commissioner talked about those, warned people that this is what you need to do. 
before you come to vote tomorrow. So um, uh, maybe now, as the US Embassy said, and as the Supreme Court said, that um, whatever, is, whatever happened, the few errors that the commission itself admits to, the commission admits that there were few problems that maybe in the runoff, it can then correct those uh, problems. Thank you. Um, you alluded to the State Department, the embassy statement, and there is a, a fairly long question uh, that boils down to saying that the, Monroe, the, the Monrovia embassy went rogue in issuing that statement that it wasn't authorized or approved from Washington. Is there anyone from the State Department here today? Having served as the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, ambassadors do not have to get approval from Washington to issue a local statement, ever. I was ambassador and I was assistant secretary. The only area where we have to get approval from Washington is if we're talking to the international press. So the embassy did not go rogue. Our embassies are issuing statements on a regular basis. And if they had to get every statement issued, approved by Washington, they would not be doing anything. So that is absolutely incorrect. Thank you. Um, and the other side of it is that you always have to answer for it, whatever decision you make. Uh, so it's a big responsibility. You think about it twice before you do it. Uh, Liberia's biggest problem is corruption and a state of kle kleptocracy. What advice do you have for the new government to address this issue? I know that I've heard that this is the biggest thing that people would love to see somehow eliminated. Don't do it. <laughs> you know, I, I think sometimes <clears throat> government uh, people run because they now think it's their time. And so it's really important if, uh, if they care about corruption that they don't do it and they hold their people accountable. They start from day one holding uh, their people accountable. Uh, what I find happening is everybody looks back. So the last government did it and they spent all their time trying to go after the last government and while they're going after the last government, their people are stealing forward. So uh, they have to deal with their own government's uh, uh, actions and responsibilities and if they want to start holding people accountable, they have to start putting uh, procedures in place to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Well, do you think the procedures that were put in place in this government, uh, an anti-corruption commission and uh, disclosure laws and so on, they sound great. Uh, where did it fall apart? You know, it's implementation, and it's not just Liberia. Uh, if we look uh, across the continent, the AU just completed a study uh, in which uh, they reflected that uh, over $60 billion per year in Africa gets lost to, uh, to corruption. Uh, so this is a, it's, it's a continent-wide problem. It's a problem not just in Africa. Uh, it's a problem uh, all over the world, but the impact when you look at a poor country like Liberia or other uh, poor countries, the impact is a lot greater uh, in those countries. But I think uh, the, the laws are in place. It's implementation of the law that is uh, missing in many places. Um, I don't want to suggest it per se, but you know, there are countries in Africa that's high on the uh, international transparency um, for example, they, they, there's a transparency, what is it called? International index. The index. And African countries have scored pretty well on some African countries, south of the Sahara, have scored pretty highly on the index. And they include countries like Botswana. And um, one of the things that Botswana has done, they have the same uh, um, corruption agency transparency groups that look into these contracts, but they try to follow the law and implement it properly. And one of the things they do, they have international non Botswana people on those commissions, as al along with the locals, you know. 
uh, it will be harder to influence someone on that kind of commission if they're from a different country and they're not involved in the politics. Thank you. Thank you. If I may briefly, I think we have to remember as well that corruption is an issue not just at the top level, but at many levels of society, and that police corruption, for example, is another issue that people are confronted with on a daily basis. And part of that is, is, is a result of the informal economy in Liberia being so large. People do not always receive the largest part of their income through the formal economy, but have to find alternative means in order to get food on the table. And I think that that's, that's an issue that's gonna take uh, quite a few years uh, to resolve. And um, um, yeah, I think that there are some, some countries out there that, that could serve as a, as a positive example for that. Yes, and certainly with the media, that was uh, alluded to because when the media uh, don't make enough money to live, uh, you get people buying stories, you get, uh, biases in the media that is exactly the opposite of what we want the media to be. Uh, this question is probably too big uh, for us to deal with, but I think we all really want to think through this, and I, uh, if somebody has answers, they're welcome to give them. What are your perspectives on the implications of a WIA or Bokai presidency in terms of governance, the economy, and security. What would these look like under each presidency? Would someone please write a, a paper on that and share it with us? We'll send it to the mailing list if, if you can determine what each what that would look like. Any comments? <laughs> I think it remains to be seen. Uh, we can never say what, uh, how successful someone is going to be as a president and what they uh, will uh, become because people tend to surprise us. So uh, it's up to the Liberian people. They're gonna like one of them. And then we all, as I said earlier, have to come together to try to help that person to succeed. I had the privilege to talk to both of them so to, I'm just going to tell you what they say. So um, uh, the vice president feels that, uh, although he was vice president for 12 years, that uh, he has an opportunity to serve as president, and that uh, he's a doer, that once he becomes president, he will be able to do implement his own program. Uh, he was serving as vice president, and so he needs to be given a chance to serve uh, to show the people what he can do. Wea tells me that um, he think the people voted for him in the first round, or they have been voting for him all these years, because they think he is the one that can bring uh, the development that they need. Um, he, or he goes back to what he's done to bring peace, uh, he said he worked in the Salif government as a peace ambassador, and he was able to bring people together. Uh, in this last comment he made just two weeks ago that uh, the people uh, will elect him because he feels, they feel that he can bring development, needed development. So that's what the two candidates are saying. It's up to the Liberian people to choose who they want as their president. A question about the Liberian Constitution. Uh, doesn't it address what happens in the, ish, in the absence of a sitting president uh, about transition? And um, I'm not sure, is it not something to suggest otherwise? Uh, would someone who's studied this like to address it? I, I know it addresses what happens in the case of uh, presidents that die or are removed from office, but as far as the end of a term happening without an elected president, I am not aware that it addresses that, so it seems as if we would be projecting onto the process a process that's actually different. It's apples and oranges that that you're not talking about the 
uh, unexpected end of a presidency. You're talking about a transition at the end of a period. So would the same line of succession take place? Is that something that the Supreme Court would have to decide? Anyone speculate? I don't know. The, the only thing I know that has been coming up in the last week or so is that uh, um, people uh, on, on one side of this uh, uh, debate or dispute about the first round, people thought there were some, um, the people who filed the complaint were trying to play some kind of a trick to delay the process so that an interim government will come about. So I don't know what constitutional thing it will pose. I cannot explain, but this is what I've been hearing. And so I kept asking the people, where did we get that idea about interim government? You know, that the people want to form an interim government. They thought some people were delaying the process so that eventually it will create a constitutional crisis. I haven't gone into detail about the type of constitutional crisis, but uh, this is, some people think this is kind of a, you know, a trick that some people are playing. Kevin, do you have? Um, one of our Friends of Liberia members has been studying all the election process for us and sending out bulletins, which is one of the many benefits you can get by being a member of Friends of Liberia. <laughs> but um, do you have any comment from um, you're looking? My name, is, uh, my name is Kevin. Kevin George, I, who's a former president I of I just want to uh, recognize the panel for the wonderful discussion that's been held. It's really rich. And uh, the only thing I would say about that question is, um, First of all, that the Supreme Court has really acted competently this year in this election season. I think that needs to be recognized. While the judiciary of Liberia has problems, the Supreme Court is very strong. It appears to be uh, operating above uh, levels of corruption uh, with uh, competency and professionalism. And I think that they will want to do everything possible to avoid a situation where uh, government lapses in January. I think it's January, uh, it's the third working Monday in January, which I think is January, 3rd, uh, January 20th. And um, so I think they really want to have a decision. That's why they've been pushing the election commission to get a decision, because the election law and the constitution provides for the election commission for an appeal to be exhausted before the election commission and, and if someone's not happy with the election commission's decision to go to the Supreme Court. So that's why the Supreme Court's been pushing them, so that they can make that decision. Uh, if they rule uh, and say that there's no basis for the appeal before the election commission, then the runoff election proceeds, and that could all happen before exactly. January 20th. If they rule that the October 10th election was not valid um, because of irregularities, because of massive fraud, then uh, that creates a problem where there's probably just not enough time for the election commission to organize another election. Um, and for this would also be for the House of Representatives because the October 10th election was for the House of Representatives as well. And if, uh, we get to the end of the Sirleaf administration on January 20th and there's still no election, then the Constitution does provide under Article 64 that uh, the Speaker of the House uh, becomes the acting president until or, uh, elections can be organized. And there's a 90-day period. Yes, there's but there will not be... Right. Or incompetency, yes. Yeah, so one could argue that that's... Not relevant. Right. And there won't be a speaker if there's no elections. Right. So, <laughs> but these are the only provisions in, only only provisions in the Constitution, that apply. So the Supreme Court may try to apply that. In that case, there would be no House of Representatives in existence. So it would fall, to, the Speaker pro temp of the Senate, perhaps. Yeah. So as, as was said, this could be chaos or it could be proving the 
installation of a real rule of law system in Liberia. And so I think we're all looking forward to the possibility that Liberia is going to shine and show its best side, but be ready for contingencies. Um, Jonas, you wanted yeah, to say briefly, something? Yeah, briefly, I think. Uh, we have to remember as well that in August, the Supreme Court also played an important role in, in maintaining, uh, keeping the peace and, 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 and preventing certain tensions from, from erupting further when the issue of the Code of Conduct came up, uh, Code of Conduct stating that certain presidential candidates would have to resign from their position several years before um, 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 the presidential elections would take place. And there it took a very pragmatic approach, I think both showing its teeth, but also showing some, some pragmatism in, in considering that the, um, um, there was not an egregious uh, mistake being made in allowing certain candidates to run, which certainly helped the inclusiveness of the election process. And when it comes to mitigating tensions, then certainly the inclusiveness of a process is, is, is quite important. So I think uh, this is the second time that uh, Supreme Court has the opportunity to shine. Thank you. Uh, I think this card, um, we'll need to close with it. Um, I think it sums up what we want to feel. Is it too much to ask that our friends rejoice with us as we make a transition to a place where we as Liberians can disagree, not resort to violence, but have the rule of law take its course? Yes. <laughs> I think uh, that, that's, a very, that's a fair way to come up but because I got a call from someone the uh, other day. They want to come on the program to talk to Liberians about uh, peace and reconciliation, to talk about reconciliation. Um, and I thought, OK, I'll give you the platform, although I think probably you should first try with the local media. But I say I can give him the platform to talk about reconciliation. Um, um, yes, that's the next place to go. Yeah. It's the next thing to do because after this election, and this is where the media comes in. I was just in Liberia in September, and I, let me say there's a proliferation of media, radio, television, plenty of that. Um, it, uh, it, should, it should be guided so that it sh the, the, the commentators and the guests I mean, they can, they should know how they are addressing the people so as not to inflame the situation. Because I was listening to some people speaking on you know, some of the radio stations, and I said, oh my God, this is going to lead to a fight. I mean, people were almost fighting, you know, um, and that has to be controlled, you know, managed so that people respect the other person. Uh, even though they come, they're coming from two different political parties or two different viewpoints, respect the viewpoint of the other person when, they come, when you come on the radio to talk. Uh, some people were condescending, in particular some officials, so uh, they didn't respect the other person, the, their view. So I think this is where the media come in to make sure that they are preaching how Liberians can come together after this whole election. Yes, I think we see even in our country the role of media, how it can be both uh, for good and twisted in other ways as well. Uh, so it's not a unique Liberian problem for sure. We have to close right now. We'll have uh, time for everyone to talk in the uh, reception area. And we have an exhibit also by an NGO that works with Liberian women who make quilts. And if you've been in Liberia, you know that the quilts in Liberia are, are so precious. Um, and he will be able to talk to you outside. If it's one minute. OK. Uh, actually, it's it's two brief comments, less than one. But less still than less one than minute. one minute. Okay. And, and, uh, <laughs> please wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, very quickly, uh, my name is Joe James. I'm an African American. I'm not a Liberian. I've been a 33-year economic development professional, so I'm pained that there's not been more talk about economic development and job creation 
And the women that I support make quilts to, to earn school fees. But let me say something, as, again, as an African American. I didn't know anything about Liberia until I went there in 2007. And as I, as I understood the history better, there are Americans in, Liber in Liberia who went there at the end of slavery that we've not helped to connect back to their families here. So when I see the sign, Friends of Liberia, there could be so many more if we could energize the African American community here to be a better partner and, and to work for Liberia. So I, I just, as an African American, I just say that as a opportunity for uh, things to be better there. I think I'll put you in touch with a professor. Uh, Thank you. Like a professor uh, prior to this election. It's later. She called me and said that they did uh, some kind of genealogy study for all the candidates in the election. And they, they found. Yeah, and he found that uh, almost all of them, most of them had connection with the, the United States or the African American community. So maybe we can connect and then you can talk further on that. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, we do have to cut off our live streaming. Um, if you would like, if you have some ideas that you would like to share, uh, for me to share with whatever new government comes, please just come up here and write your suggestions on the flip chart and they'll be incorporated. Thank you very much.